It's amazing how songs can bring back memories. I know Kaylee said the, how he loves song brought her back to India, and I remember singing that in India. I remember singing that in South Africa. I just has a way of cementing things in your mind, which, which is, by the way, why songs are so good for memorization. Uh, my girls either look up songs for the verses they memorize or they make them up, and, and I think it's just really helpful for them. I, I love that little two-letter word in... Uh, you know how he loves the word so, which reminds me of uh, probably the most famous Bible verse, John three sixteen, right? For God, what? So loved the world. Just an, an amazing love. A love that, that two little word almost kind of tells us that that love is even greater than we could ever comprehend. He so loved us. Amen? Amen. That has nothing to do with our lesson, but uh, I just wanted to start with that. I do want to start our lesson with a story, though. Um, there was a man who, uh, who was walking across a bridge and came in across another man who was leaning over the railing that looked over a river, and uh, he thought, uh, you know, the man was by himself. He looked kind of lonely, so he thought, hey, I'll, I'll start a conversation with him and ask him a few questions. And so the first question he asked, he said, hey, uh, don't mind if I, uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? And the guy said, no. He said, well, are you a, are you a Christian or a non-Christian? The man replied, I'm a Christian. Uh, he said, oh, me too, small world. That's great. He said, well, are you, uh, are you Protestant or Catholic? The man said, I'm, I'm Protestant. He said, me too. Awesome. What, what, uh, what denomination? He said, I'm Baptist. He's like, wow, me too. Are you, uh, are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? The guy said, I'm, I'm Southern Baptist. He said, wow, Southern Baptist, me too. What are the odds? He said, uh, well, are you uh, Southern Conservative Baptist or Southern Liberal Baptist? He said, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm Southern Conservative Baptist. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I I, this is crazy. Well, are you Southern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Southern Conservative Reform Baptist? The man said, I'm definitely Southern Baptist Conservative Baptist. And he said, wow, this is, this is remarkable. Well, are you Southern Baptist Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Carolinas or Southern Baptist Conservative Fundamentalist Gulf Coast? And he said, well, I'm definitely Southern Conservative Fundamentalist Carolinas. It's like, that's a miracle. So am I. He's like, okay, so are you, are you Southern Conservative Funda Fundamentalist Baptist Carolinas Council of 1890? Or Southern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Carolinas Council of 1910? And he boldly declared, well, I'm Southern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Carolinas Council of 1910. To which the guy said, die, heretic, and pushed him over the railing into the river. <laughs> And so as we continue our series FAQ, you can kind of guess where we're headed tonight, right? We're going to ask and, and attempt to answer the question, why is there so much division in the church? Why are there so many seemingly denominations within even just the Protestant church in America, right? I mean, if, if you were to read through the New Testament letters to the churches, you would see that division is nothing new. That conflict is nothing new. As a matter of fact, you discover a number among the very first Christians in the first century. There were disagreements about eating meat, sacrificed to idols. Uh, we see this in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and Colossians. Paul addresses the proper role of angels in new moon celebrations. In Philippians, he makes a strong plea for unity between two women who were feuding, apparently. They just weren't getting along. And so listen, this is 2,000 years later, still issue, right? That we have these divisions, these conflicts within the church. If you have your Bibles, guys, if you would, turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And before I answer the question tonight, before I really kind of get into why there's so much division in, on the church, I, I want to talk a little bit about Jesus' heart for oneness, okay, for unity. And, and in John chapter 17, we see the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. The prayer, I would say, is extended in scope. Um, it covers a lot of verses, but it also covers a lot of time. In fact, it stretches across 20 centuries because Jesus wasn't just praying for his disciples that were there and in, in present in that time and place, but he was praying for all of his disciples that would ultimately come, including us here today. And so it's, it's really a pretty amazing prayer. And after Jesus left the upper room, if you remember, he paused along his walk to the Mount of Olives. And in verse 1, look at what it says of John 17. You guys there? Say amen. All right, it says, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, 
And if you were to kind of break down and outline this prayer, there's three requests that fill Jesus' heart. In the first five verses, we see he prays for himself to be glorified. Then in the next 13 verses, he prays for his disciples to be protected and, and set apart, sanctified. And then in the final three verses, he prays for his believers, for believers in him to be unified. And so that's really what we're going to focus on today. It's found in verses 20 through 23 of chapter 17. I want you to look at really this part of the prayer that Jesus prayed, starting in verse 20. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through, the, through their word, that they may all be one. Be what, guys? One. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. Listen, we see it here, this is obviously on Jesus' heart, because he basically repeats the same thing three times, right, in his prayer. That we would be one, that we may be one, that we would become perfectly one. And so guys, I think that the best advertisement the church could set forth to the world is a witness of oneness, right? That we are unified, that, that we would, the world would see that we have come together in unity and display the personality, purposes, and power of God. We could say it this way, I, no church can do everything, right? But every church can do something, and together we can do anything with God empowering us. And so I want to give you four expectations about unity in this prayer that Jesus prayed. The first one is that the scope of oneness includes all believers. Notice that Jesus here is praying for all believers, right? He doesn't just want us to get along with a few people that we happen to like or get along with, uh, or only those that are in our church, but he wants us all to be one, as he says. His prayer is really much deeper than, than just a few people, just my best friends, right? Just my particular congregation. In verse 23, Jesus longs for us to become perfectly one. True believers in Christ share a common unity or community. And we share it not just with those here now, but with those in the past, in the present, and in the future. And so I want to consider three encouragements, I think, that will help us become one. And the first one is this. We need to abandon being elitist. You guys know what elitist means? That we feel like we're what? Better than other people or believers specifically, Right? I think some believers refuse to acknowledge that there are true Christians in other churches. <laughs> it, it's a problem. I've been in some churches that were that way. And, and so we need to understand we don't have an exclusive lock on truth, nor does any other church, right? I, I love being a part of a non-denominational Bible-believing church, but that doesn't mean that we are in any way superior to others. If someone is a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, then he or she is my brother or sister in Christ, Right? And so, and so look at it this way, even with our, our large sanctuary, right, here at CBC, uh, as well as our live streaming capabilities, can we reach everyone? We can't, right? We can't reach everyone. It's, it's, and, and so we, we need to understand that, that the, the church is meant to be in all the places where there's believers. And so it's easy to think that even just here in Beaufort County as we look around, that it's saturated with churches that are getting the gospel out, right? Right. You see churches all over the place, right? I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but you just have to drive down Paris Island Gate where you're going to see a bunch of churches. But, but as of the last census, by far the fastest growing group when it comes to religion in our county is those that claimed no religion. Those that claimed that they weren't part of, of any religious group. It actually grew by over 30% since the previous census. And my fear is as they do the census this year, we're going to see that it's continuing to grow and, and that's continuing to be the group that's growing the fastest. Listen, if the stats are right, that means that somewhere now of over 60% of the people in Beaufort County claim no religion. And so if you look at how many people there are in our county, it's right about 200,000. That's 120,000 people that want nothing to do with any religion, really. And so if you, if you do the math, right, I'm not great at math, but I think I can figure this out. That means there's 80,000 people that represent all the other religions, include many who claim Christianity, but probably don't really know the gospel, right? And so it, when, I, when I was looking at these numbers and when I was kind of going over this, it, I kind of was sad. You guys, any of you guys feel that? I, I, I was sad. I was, I was disappointed. 
that there are so many of our neighbors right here who don't know Christ and who are headed to an eternity without him if, 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 if we don't reach out, if we don't make an effort to reach them. And so I think we need to, we need to increase our efforts to live on mission right here with our neighbors as well as throughout the nations for Christ. Listen to what God said in Ezekiel 20, 30. He said, And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And so my question is, listen, right here, right now in 2020, what's today, October 22nd? If God were to look down and say, you know, I'm, I'm looking for someone in Beaufort County who's going to stand up and, 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 and reach these people with the gospel, is he going to find anyone? Right? Is he, is he going to find one of us? Will we stand in the gap by building gospel bridges with those just around us who don't know Christ? Listen, I've had the privilege over the years of getting to know many gospel preaching pastors. And, I, and I've sensed a, a growing commitment, I think, in just the last few months and, and even years to, to pray for a spirit of evangelism in our churches, to pray for revival in our country. And when Jesus looked at how helpless the lost were, Remember, he was filled with compassion. And he said these words to his disciples in Matthew 9, 37 and 38. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so here's what I'm convinced of. You guys want to hear what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced that we need more revitalized, Bible-teaching, gospel-proclaiming churches and more revived Christians if we're going to hope to reach our community, our county, and our country for, for Christ. Amen? I remember, let me say this kind of parenthetically though, I remember sitting in churches as a teenager and hearing calls to evangelism, hearing calls to missions, and talking about even, it was many years ago, many, many years ago, obviously. Um, even back then, you know, hearing some of the statistics, I, I grew up in France and the statistics when I was growing up was that of born again believers was one half of one percent of the population, so that's you know one in two hundred people basically that that was that claimed to be a born again believer. Uh, it's 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 not a good statistic, you know. It's it was it was pretty bad, pretty dark. Um, and I remember even hearing those things in the country where I lived and thinking, I'm I'm just a teenager. I mean, what what difference can, can I really make? What can I do? But, but let me just encourage you guys. I, I've, also, I've had teenagers over the years ask me kind of that same question and say, listen, you know, what, what can I do? Well, here's my answer. God, God saw fit to bring me into full-time ministry and to use me to impact lives over the past dozen years. And I've also seen students come through our youth ministry right here at Community Bible Church and go into full-time ministry, go into cross-cultural missions, go, in, go to work at camps and churches and counseling and many other former students who went into the secular world that are living and, and being a light for Christ in their, in their jobs. Listen, none of us can do everything, right? But we can all do what? Something, right? Can we all be used by God for his kingdom and his purposes? Amen. And so I, I just want to not tell you guys, don't get discouraged, right? We hear a lot of negative things about what's happening spiritually in our country, and our world, but, but know that there are also many amazing things that are happening. I, I told you guys this, I think, a couple weeks ago, but Pastor Vince confirmed it to me again that, that we're hearing again and again from our missionaries that God is at work over these past few months with pandemic and, and shutdowns and lockdowns and all these different things. But, but God is working in a, in a way that, that, that many of our missionaries haven't seen before. People are searching. People are asking. And, and, and I think it's much the same in our community. And so don't be discouraged by the number of people turning away from God, but looking, look at it as, a, as an opportunity. That there's a pretty good chance if you're looking for opportunities to have spiritual conversations and to share the gospel that you're going to come across someone pretty quickly who doesn't know Jesus, right? And there may be an open door there. And so these are opportunities to reach someone. But in order to do that, we need to abandon being elitist and looking down at people, right? And, and understand that God loves each and every person unconditionally and he desires as the bible says for all to be saved and to come into a saving knowledge of jesus christ and he wants to use us as the primary means to do that are we available to him so abandon that secondly I, we need to avoid broad ecumenicalism i know that's a big word right so let me let me explain it uh, ecumenical means to be all inclusive you guys you guys know what i mean by that um it means that there's a push in our country, in our society especially, 
for uniformity among churches. And, and, and that's something that, that we need to avoid. There are doctrinal differences and biblical distinctions that, that we need to hold on to, that we need to maintain. Earlier in his same prayer, as a matter of fact, if you look, look up at verse 17, Jesus established that sanctification can only happen when it's based on Scripture. Look at what he says. Sanctify them in the truth. In the what, guys? In the truth. And then he says, your word is truth. So he tells us that we need to be set apart in his truth. And then he tells us where that truth is found. It's in the word of God. And so truth alone must determine our alignments and partnerships. Frankly, listen, we're not all headed in the same direction spiritually, right? Not all churches are headed in the same direction. And we do not all serve the same God. Only those who are born again are really ultimately our brothers and sisters in the faith. And so, and so I, I want you to, to write this down because I think it's, it's important if you are taking notes tonight. And that is that compromising on the fundamentals is a fundamental error. We, we, we can't do that. And too many churches, unfortunately, are doing that. They are compromising on the fundamentals of the faith. One journalist years ago said it this way when he was writing about the World Council of Churches. He said they agreed on almost everything because they believed almost nothing. <laughs> And I think that's what's happening in many of our churches. It's just to try to, to not upset anyone, right? They're compromising. And so they can agree because really, ultimately, they're not standing up for anything. And so we need to avoid that. We need to avoid that, that, that push that's especially in our country, but it's happening in other places as well, to be all inclusive and, and say everything's okay and you can kind of believe whatever you want, Right? No, we need, to, we need to be united, and Jesus prayed for us to be one, but it's in the truth. It needs to be grounded in his word. And then thirdly, let me encourage you with this, and I think our church does a good job of this. We need to aim for unity within diversity, right? It's possible to be di diverse and yet not divided. We're all distinct pieces of the puzzle, and variety is valuable because we have different gifts, we have different abilities, different personalities, thoughts, and opinions. We, we may look different, we may come from different backgrounds. Listen, we're not called to be the same, right, but we're called to be one. That's what Jesus is praying for. That means that we can disagree on certain things. There's areas of freedom without being disagreeable. It's not simply what we believe that matters, but how we behave. Right? And that's important. We can have harmony even though we're not necessarily homogenous, right? We don't necessarily all look the same. And, and, and let me tell you guys, this is also a problem in the church today. That, that, and there's certain churches that are going after this, that they want a certain look, a certain group, they want to reach a certain age, a certain socioeconomic status, but that's not God's heart. And, and, and unfortunately, all. Too often, Christians divide over matters of taste, not truth. But we need to be growing together, even when we don't look the same, even when we don't come from the same places. We're to be one. Augustine is attributed to having said this, that in, in, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. I mean, I understand, I understand what he's saying, but, but listen, we... We need to aim for unity within diversity, right? And, and again, I think, I think we do a good job of that here at our church. But could we get better? Absolutely, right? We, we could always be better. And so, guys, firstly, as, as, as we look at these, it's important to understand that the scope of oneness includes all of us, all believers. But secondly, the standard for oneness is shown in the unity within the Trinity, in verse 11, Jesus prayed that his disciples would experience the oneness that exists in his relationship with the Father. And in verse 21, look at what he says, may they also be in us. And then again in verse 22, he said that they may be one even as we are one. And so the unity that Christ wants us to have is personal. It's, it's intimate. It, it's, it's so vital and it's patterned after. It's based on the relationship that exists within the Godhead, within the Trinity. We looked at the Trinity just a few weeks ago. You, you guys remember that? And so if you, if you want to learn more about really how that works, as best we can understand from God's Word, if you miss it, you can watch it. It's on the church website. But that's the standard that's given for us. It's the Trinity. That we're to be one as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. Thirdly, I want you to see the significance of oneness, and it's that it makes Christ known. Look at verse 21. 
Jesus prays that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Again, I think one of the most effective witnesses to an unbelieving world is unity within the church, right? I think when, when, when a world that is without hope, is without, without knowledge of what's going to happen after death and all these other things, when they look at the church and when they see us come together and when they see the hope that's not tied to our circumstances and, 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 and when they see the oneness, there's going to be a desire to be a part of that. And so it's really a witness this, that it's, a, it's significant that, that this oneness is so that Christ can be known. Finally, guys, the sight of oneness, when people see it, it puts Christ's reputation on display to the entire world. Verse 22 says that we have been given the glory that was given to Christ. And the word glory really represents the visible manifestation of God's attributes, right? And so when we are united, the world will stand up and take notice. They'll see it. Because they will see God glorified in us. I mean, that's what Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so are, are we shining our light so that we get the glory? No, that's not the purpose, right? So that God gets the glories and people are drawn not to us, but ultimately to Christ and to God the Father. And so guys, if Jesus prayed for unity, if this was on his heart, right, right before he went to the cross, if this was on his heart and he prayed for it three times, that we would be united, looking down the corridors of time, even 2,000 years to where we are now, that we would be one, why then is there so much division in the church? Translated from the Greek, the word church in Greek is ekklesia or ekklesia. You guys heard that before? Um, and, and, it, and it literally means to be called out, to, to call out from among. And so there's, there's two ways that the church is used in Scripture. The first way is when sometimes the word ecclesia is used, it's for the universal church. And, and so the universal church, what it represents is all born-again believers called out from all different walks of life in every culture and country around the world. True believers are joined together as one people who share in one spirit and worship one Lord, right? That's the universal church. And so sometimes when it talks about the church, it's talking about the church as a whole. But then it also many times is talking about unique churches, all the different specific unique churches. And so while there is one universal church, it is represented by many unique churches that are scattered all over the globe. We see this as a matter of fact in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Paul writes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called out to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both, in their, Lord, both their Lord and ours. The New Testament strongly urges us, if you remember, to gather together, right, in local churches. And Hebrews 10, 25 urges us not to forsake that, the gathering of the church. And so I, I'm sure maybe you guys have been asked before, maybe you've asked yourself if no one has asked you, why are there so many different denominations, right? You guys notice that? We have, we have so many different denominations. And this is, you know, there, there's other countries where there's quite a few denominations, but nothing like what we have here in the United States. Why are there so many divisions between Christians? And so, and so let me give you guys really some ways that you can answer this question, some reasons why there's divisions. And it's really going to be six reasons, seven, if you, if, if you count, what, I think, what the result is of these divisions. The first one I, I want to talk about is dispersion. One of, the, one of the reasons there are differences among churches goes back to the command of Jesus to make disciples of all nations. And we see this really kind of explained in Acts 1-8 where he says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then in Acts 1.15, we're told that about 120 believers gathered in Jerusalem. And just a short time later, in the next chapter, Acts 2.41, 3,000 were saved as a result of Peter's sermon on, on the day of Pentecost. And then by Acts 4, this number has grown to 5,000. And, and, and there's Samaritans and there's Gentiles that are added to the church. And then it, it spreads to strategic cities like Antioch and Ephesus and Rome. And so as the, the church has started to to be planted in, in different places and the gospel was going to different countries, the message and methods adapted to different cultures and contexts kind of changed, right? You guys know what I'm saying? 
They, it varied, and, and, and some of these kind of split off. Uh, I've seen that as I've traveled to different places in the world. Uh, for example, if you were to go to a church service in Ukraine, it is completely, almost diametrically opposed to a church service that you would attend in South Africa. Now, are they, are they both believers in Christ? Absolutely, but have they kind of adapted the services to their culture? Yeah, in Ukraine, they don't, they don't clap. They really don't have any emotion. It's very reverent. Um, they basically stand and sit. That's what you're expected to do during the service. Uh, in South Africa, on the other hand, they dance. <laughs> they dance, and, and, and they move all over the place, and, and it's, it's, it's interactive, and um, it's, it's completely different, but it's, a, it's the same God that they're worshiping in those places. They're just doing it differently based on their culture. I mean, that happened in our country as well. If you remember, our country was really started by colonists who came here oftentimes to flee religious persecution in other places like in Europe and, and, and to be able to, to, to worship God the way that they felt called. But what happened even as our, as our country started to grow is that these colonists gathered in different places based on the way that they worshiped. And so we had Congregationalists in New England, Roman Catholics in Maryland, Quakers in Pennsylvania, Presbyterians in Virginia, Baptists in the Midwest, and, 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 and Anglicans in, in the Carolinas. I mean, and on and on, right? These people kind of found people who wanted to worship like them and, and went to these specific places. And so the universal church and unique churches are made up from people of all different cultures, languages, and backgrounds. We have some people, maybe you've been to churches like this, who, who quote creeds, right? Who recite the Lord's Prayer. Um, some are very liturgical, meaning that they follow a strict order of service. Other churches are kind of free-flowing in their approach. It's not all bad, right? And it's not necessarily wrong again, as long as they're teaching the Bible and reaching out with the gospel to everyone in their community. But it's really a, a result of the spreading, the dispersion. And churches going into all these different places, it kind of has created some division. Secondly, there's been division over doctrine, right? Not just spreading to different places, but doctrine. Some churches disagree because of doctrinal differences. And, and, and really, this is no small matter. In, in Jude verse 3, it's written that, that we need to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And so listen, we as a church... There are some things, again, that we're just not going to compromise on, right? We're not going to compromise on the inerrancy of Scripture, on the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, salvation by grace through faith. And, and there's some other key beliefs that, that we're, we're just not going to compromise on. We're going to continue to proclaim that life begins at conception, that, that God's plan for marriage and the family is a covenant between one man and one woman for life. Now, our culture may change on some of these things. Our, our government may change on some of these things. But we as a church are going to stand up for those things. Those are, those are the, the doctrines that we believe are, are fundamental to what we believe because they're taught in Scripture, right? We didn't make them up. But then there's many, many other doctrines that come down the line that have ultimately divided churches over the centuries. And so it's become a point of division instead of unification. Thirdly, there's depravity, and I think this is probably at the root of all of these. One big reason congregations split and denominations divide is simply because we are self-centered and selfish sinners, right? Sometimes the only explanation is the evil in our own hearts. And this is described, I think, graphically. If you listened to me last night, I quoted this verse, Galatians 5.15. Paul writes, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. <laughs> and so left to itself, does our sin nature draw us closer together? No, right? It ultimately tr pulls us apart. And we need to be aware of that. We need to know that that's kind of our default mode. And be intentional about being unified. Fourthly, there's disputes. There's disputes. In the first part of Acts 15, the early church was faced really with a theological crisis, which was ultimately resolved when the Jerusalem Council established that Gentiles don't have to become Jewish in order to be saved because salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. And they put this in a letter and they delivered it to, to the churches and Acts 15.31 tells us how it received. And when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. 
But right here in just the very first churches, we already saw some of the first disputes, right? And they had to call together councils to resolve these. And, and there's disputes that have continued to go on in churches over the years. And, and, and beyond disputes, there's been disagreements. When, when a peaceful resolution was found to a very divisive and difficult dispute in the same chapter... We see Paul and Barnabas end up having a relational separation related to whether John Mark still had a future in ministry with them, right? Acts 15, 39 says, And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. They had a sharp disagreement, and what was the result? What was the result, guys? Do you hear it? They what? They divided, right? They separated from each other. And so we have these disputes and these disagreements that, that separate not just people, but entire churches. Sixthly, I want you to see that there's devotion that can become divisive. Sometimes churches disagree and divide because of mission or methodology. And, 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 as, I, and as I read through some of the history of some of the denominations this, this past week, I discovered that groups often splinter because some believers were looking to go deeper in the faith, well, others really didn't have that same desire, right? And, and, and Romans 12, 11, it tells us a little bit about this. That it, Paul writes, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And so in short, they wanted to grow and then go with the gospel in order to reach their neighbors and the nations. But not everybody had that same desire or that same devotion, Right? And so I think that happens sometimes in our churches, and it brings about division. And the seventh and final reason, which is really ultimately the result of all the ones that I've just listed, due to the dispersion doctrine, our own depravity, disputes, disagreements, and levels of devotion, is that a spirit of divisiveness can settle on Christians. We see this described in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, where Paul writes that they were saying in the church, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos. Or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And then Paul asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I mean, he, he's, he's having to, to correct some of these divisions, right? Right in this, in this church that's right there in the first century. And unfortunately, churches have divided over all kinds of silly things. From the color of carpets to the needing to wear masks for a few minutes on your way in or on your way out, Right? During a pandemic, there's all kinds of reasons that, that, that people have disagreed and ultimately caused division within the church. Listen, make no mistake, our opponent, who's our opponent? The devil, right? He will look for the tiniest little cracks in a congregation in an attempt to drive a giant wedge into a body of believers. We need to be aware of that. We need to be, we need to be careful about that. And so what this has done is it's created all these different denominations, right? You guys, as you drive around town, you probably see church billboards that say all kinds of different things, right? There's three main branches of Christianity. And then within those, there's all kinds of kind of splinters from there. But there's Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant. And now there's some skeptics who like to say, oh, there's more than 30,000 different denominations within Protestantism. But that, that's... That's a myth. It's an exaggeration. There's actually closer to 300 actual, actual recognized denominations. Some that come to mind that you guys are probably familiar with are Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglicans, Pentecostals, and Episcopals, right? And so right here, if you were to just drive up Paris Island Gateway, there's a Church of God right across the street. About a block away, there's a Korean Baptist Church. A little further up Paris Island Gateway, there's a Fundamentalist Baptist Church. Uh, a little bit further up, there's a Holiness Baptist and uh, if you go down, there's a Mormon church, and then uh, somewhere up north, there's also a Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall, right? That's all within, like, walking distance from us, basically. And so my guess is maybe you've been asked before, who's, let me ask the question, actually, who's, who's ever been asked what denomination your church is, Community Bible Church? All right, most of you. You've been asked the question, right, as I have. What, well, what denomination is your church? Well, let me give you guys an answer, and, and, and I think some of you guys probably already have this answer, but... We're a non-denominational church, which means that we're not part of any particular denomination. And, and it actually gives, what it gives us is it gives us freedom in our operation. 
freedom in, in, in our use of finances. It doesn't tie us to the ever-changing and often compromising mainline denominations. Um, some of the ones that I listed earlier, they've gone way off track as far as what God's Word says. And, and, and so one of, the, what, one of the things that I often tell people is that our name really reflects who we are, right? We are a Bible-believing and preaching church looking to reach our community for Christ. So you put that together, we're community Bible church. One of the things that, that drew Amy and I here almost 11 years ago was that this church reflects the community. That there are people here from many different ethnic, socioeconomic, and age groups. And, and, and we have a, a heart and a desire to grow together through the proclamation of biblical truth and through the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ to our neighborhoods and, and, and to the nations through the over 300 missionaries that we support on a monthly basis around the world. And so that, that's, that's who we are. And, and, and I'm proud to be a part of this church, to be on staff here, to be able to, to teach you guys. But again, I remember and, and warn myself as well as everybody else that that doesn't make us better than anybody, right? Really, ultimately, at the foot of the cross, we're all sinners saved by grace. And we, we need to remember that. I want to touch, guys, in the time that I have left tonight on a couple of topics that have brought a lot of division, caused much disagreement among denominations, and that's baptism and communion. It's interesting to me that Jesus began his public ministry with what? Baptism, and he ended it with what? Really, communion, right? And, and so these are important. Baptism and communion are called ordinances because they are especially ordained or ordered by Jesus. We don't use the word that some other denominations use. That's the word sacrament because that word carries connotations which can lead to confusion. The Latin word sacramentum speaks of giving grace or granting some kind of special favor from God. And so, for instance, according to the Catholic Church, they have seven sacraments. Um, and, and, and they were instituted by Christ, they believe, and given to the church to administer. And here's the, here's the big breaking point as far as what we believe they believe that they are necessary for salvation that these sacraments are vehicles of grace uh, which they convey and so you uh, you have to be ultimately what they believe saved by works but these sacraments these seven sacraments hold the most weight in the works that you produce right does that make sense and so that is guys not at all what the bible teaches nowhere the bible is that found and so while, while ordinances are important, they are not in and of themselves grace-giving elements that contribute to our salvation. Our commitment here is the same as the, as the reformers. It's on the stained glass window in our sanctuary, right? The scriptures alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. That's what we believe. And baptism and communion are symbols, or they are, I like to think of them as visual aids of the gospel. That they retell the story of redemption. Ordinances, I think, are determined by three factors as, as we, we do them. They were instituted by Christ, they're taught by the apostles, and they were practiced in the early church, right? And so that's why we don't have 50 ordinances. We have two because in the Bible there's only two that were instituted by Christ, taught by the apostles, and practiced in the early church. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, we often call it the, the Great Commission, right? Jesus gives these distinctive marks of discipleship. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Doing what, guys? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Simply put, we believe in baptism, and we practice it because Christ commanded it. And so making disciples of all nations includes baptizing them. And so one of the, the one overriding truth from all the passages on baptize, baptism is this, is that it takes place after belief, right? It takes place after belief. The order is critical. The next step after being born again is to be baptized. According to Greek dictionaries or, 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 or lexicons, the primary meaning of baptize is to dip, plunge, or immerse. And so... The, the, the root actually means to totally overwhelm, in this case, with water, right? And so interestingly, while, while there were Greek words available for sprinkling or pouring, the writers of Scripture chose the word baptizo, which means most literally immersion. 
Pastor Carl goes into much more depth on this, on this series, Back to Basics and Baptism, which he was just covering in, in, in just a, the previous weeks. But, but I want to I I touch on it briefly and just ask and answer a couple questions for you guys. Maybe, maybe you weren't there or haven't seen it. But the questions that I get asked a lot are, what about infant baptism? <laughs> what, what about it, right? Should we take little Mordecai and baptize him, right? <laughs> There's a lot of, lot of our Protestant denominations that do that and, that and that believe in that. Well, in the Bible, again, which, which is our example always, belief precedes baptism in every case. So this would really eliminate babies, right? It would eliminate them getting baptized because without the ingredient of faith, baptism becomes just another church ritual. Someone put it this way, unless you have already come to faith in Jesus, being baptized does no more than get you wet. There's really no purpose to it. And so, you know, I know some churches kind of put a different spin on it. I have a friend who goes to a, a Presbyterian church up in Columbia, and he says that they, they, they baptize infants, but they don't really see it as their baptism. It's more of like a dedication or a, or a you know, a way to, to, to try to uh, um, commit them to the Lord. But it just really becomes a confusion, right? It, it becomes just a thing that... Uh, people who, who are coming to Christ and are trying to understand what their next step of obedience is going to be, it's, it's, it's confusing because the biblical standard, the biblical example is always faith before baptism. Another question that I get pretty, that I've gotten a few times and, and maybe you guys have heard, if I was baptized as an infant or at some point before my salvation, should I get baptized again, right? Now that I'm a believer. And my, my, my answer really to that is simple, Yes. Since baptism is a public statement of your own personal faith in Jesus Christ, it's important to make your statement as a believer. Actually, if your baptism was any time before you came to Christ, before you were saved, then it really wasn't baptism. I mean, if you were sprinkled as, as a baby, it wasn't biblical baptism. When you are baptized as a believer by immersion, it will be ultimately your first baptism, right? Right? And so most of you know that you can be baptized here at our church pretty much any Sunday, almost any Sunday. And so if you haven't taken that step, if you haven't been baptized since you've come to Christ, I encourage you. I encourage you to take that first step of obedience. I've, I've seen it a handful of times where people have put it off or delayed it for some reason. And, and they, they, they've kind of stunted their spiritual growth just because they weren't willing to take really that first step of obedience as a, as a public declaration, right? of what Christ has done in their life. Does that make sense? Does that maybe answer some questions there? And again, this has become a point of division in the church. And we're not, we're not trying to create controversy when it comes to it, but we're trying to do what the Bible tells us and, and the example that we see in Scripture. And so let me take just a few minutes uh, in closing here and talk about communion. If you remember the night before Jesus was crucified, he had a final meal with his closest followers, Right? This dinner was really, it was much more than a social gathering. It was rich in spiritual meaning and, and symbolism, and it went back to the first Passover. Uh, Luke explains this. If you have your Bibles, if you're in John, turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Um, and, uh, and Luke explains in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, it says, and, and Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, the, the disciples were all Jewish, and so they all would have understood what was about to happen, right? They could probably recite every word from this annual celebration supper that they'd had every year of their life. But then in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, everything changes. It says, and, and he, Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, they would have been like, what? That's not, that's not part of... That's not part of the Passover. So they probably would have been trying to figure out what was going on. And before they could fully recover from this statement that Jesus made, in verse 20, Jesus says, And likewise the cup after they had eaten. Now there's four cups that they would traditionally drink during Passover. And this was likely the third cup. And it was commonly called the cup of redemption, which was set aside for the anticipated Messiah. And so notice, guys, that Jesus here is claiming to be the fulfillment of everything that Passover represented. It's really, it, once you kind of start to wrap your head around it, it's such a beautiful thing. And so the script for this Passover supper is kind of back on track. 
But then in the second half of verse 20, Jesus startles them again when he says this, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so he's saying this represents this, this bloody death that he's about to die, which would ultimately inaugurate, bring in the new covenant spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah. And so as far as we know, as we look at the early church, this, was a, uh, this ordinance was celebrated as a memorial meal, and it was done with dignity and reverence in the church. That is, until we come to the chaotic and confused church in Corinth, right? We know they had some issues, but again, we all have issues, so we shouldn't judge them. But, but, but turn over with me to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, if you're in Luke, just, just go... Uh, a few pages, past a few books, you'll get to 1 Corinthians. And, and we're going to see here four communion commands that Paul gives. Because, again, this church had taken this, this ordinance and they really abused it. They'd taken it way past what, what it was supposed to be. And so four, four communion commands in these verses. The first one that we're going to see is to remember. And we're going to call that look back. Okay? Paul received these instructions from Jesus himself. Look at verses 23 and 25 of chapter 11. You guys there? Amen? All right. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You guys, have, at least those of you who've grown up in the church, you've heard those words many times, right? And, and, and so this was Paul's instruction to the church in Corinth that was delivered to him by the Lord Jesus. And twice in these verses, notice, he tells them that we are to remember what Jesus did for us. This celebration of communion is to be contemplative because it helps us remember often what we tend to forget, right? What Jesus really did for us upon the cross. And we need to recognize that there is wide disagreement about communion among different denominations. Let me make just a couple of points here that, that, that have divided some Christians over the years. This is one that really divides us from Catholics, and that's that the bread and cup serve as memorials of the Lord's death. They don't mystically become his body and his blood. Uh, the big, fancy theological word for that is transubstantiation. Maybe you guys have heard it. Um, but listen. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, communion, none of his disciples would have thought the bread and wine were turned into the body and blood of Jesus. After all, he was right there in the room sitting right next to them, right? And, and he was actually holding the bread and he was actually holding the, the wine in his hands. And so when Jesus, when they saw Jesus hold these elements, they would have immediately recognized them as tangible, right? That means things that you can see, touch, and, and smell, they were tangible representations of a far deeper reality. And so that they don't actually become, like Catholics believe, the body and the blood, but they are symbols. And secondly, we are remembering his death. We're not repeating the sacrifices as some Christian traditions teach, that Jesus is actually sacrificed again and again through the celebration uh, of, of, of the Mass or the, or the Eucharist. According to Hebrews 10.10, 10, Jesus has completed his sacrificial work. It's done. It's over. That's why he cried out what? It is finished, right? The writer of Hebrews writes, We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so we need to remember as we sit down for communion, whether it's Wednesday night or Sunday morning here, to, to look back, to remember. But secondly, we need to rejoice, to look forward. Look at what Paul writes in verse 26. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we're to look back and remember the cross and also look forward to the crown. To, to proclaim means to announce publicly, to, to, to declare, to, to perpetuate. And so the bread and the cup tell the story of redemption and they look forward to when Jesus returns and, and really brings all of history to its culmination. And so we eat and drink now in anticipation of the glorious banquet to come, right, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we look back, we remember, we look forward, we rejoice, and thirdly, we look within to repent. Look at verses 27 and 28. Paul writes, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty, of, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Once we remember by looking back and rejoice by looking forward, we can't help 
but look inside, right? Examine ourselves, as Paul says, to see if there's anything that we need to, to, to repent of, to ask forgiveness for. And so we're cautioned about approaching the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, but even in a routine manner, right? That, oh, this is just kind of something we do because we do it, right? And so we, we're to look within. And finally, guys, number four, we're to look around, to reconcile. Look at verses 28 and 29. He says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now drop down to verses 33 and 34, where he says, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. And so before taking communion, we should be sure that we're living in union, in unity, in oneness in community with each other. Because without, com without that communion uh, with each other, we're not going to be able to take the communion, the Lord's Supper, properly. To say it another way, communion is communal, right? It's not something we're to do all by ourselves, but it's something we're to do together. And so let me, let me ask you this. As you, as you come to communion, have you asked yourself, is there anyone that I need to forgive? Is there anyone I need to extend forgiveness to? Is there anyone that I'm out of fellowship with? Because this is something that is supposed to bring us together. In the Bible, actually, dining together signifies two things. By eating the bread and drinking the cup, we're saying that we've received redemption. And we're declaring that we are in community with one another and with the Lord. And so the sad thing is, right, this ordinance, this, this, this meal, this... Or the thing that we're supposed to do as a unifying time has become a point of division in the church. And it's sad, really. And so, guys, as, as I wrap up tonight, let me, let me give you the, really the bottom line here. As we've looked at all these different things, right? I know we've looked at a lot of things. You guys still with me? Amen, if you're still with me. All right. I was going to shorten the lesson, but then I was like, no, I really want to cover all this. <laughs> So, if, if, here's the thing. If Christ's heart is for us to be one, right? We saw that that's his heart. That's what he prayed for us. If that's his heart, is for us to be one, and the devil wants to divide, then what do we need to do? What do we need to do? We need to resolve to be one spirit. We need to resolve to not give any opportunity for the dev devil to drive his wedge of division among us. We need to stand for truth, for what's right. We need to abound in grace and gentleness, looking for every opportunity to win the loss for Christ. I think that's ultimately what our, what our heart, what our desire, what our aim should be for. And so, guys, I appeal to you as Paul did to the Corinthian believers. And remember, these guys were, were struggling with divisions, with fights, from everything from the Lord's Supper to all kinds of other things. And so when Paul wrote his first letter to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it, it, it's right there near the beginning in verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And so listen, if I could somehow have a megaphone <laughs> that went to all the other churches in our community, in our country, that would be a little weird, but... Somehow, right, speak through all the speaker systems. And I could say one thing. I would probably read this verse. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Understanding, right, that we're not going to compromise on the important things, but that we're going to do everything within our power, as Paul said, to be at peace with all men. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for what Christ has done for us. We thank you that before he went to the cross and fully finished the work of salvation, that he prayed that we would be one, that we would be one with each other, that we would be one as, as he is one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so God, I pray that you would give us not a, a heart and and. and a desire for, for disputes or, or for disagreements and divisions, but God, that you would give us a heart to be united. That we would see as we look around that, that we have so many brothers and sisters in Christ who 
we agree with on the, on, on, on the essentials, on the fundamentals, who we should be standing shoulder to shoulder with, seeking to win the loss to Christ. God, I just pray that, that you would bring unity to our country. God, I think one of the reasons why things are going the wrong direction, one re reason why we, we see so much sin and, and, and so much godlessness and so many people doing what is right in their own eyes is because there are so many divisions within the church. It's because the church isn't speaking out in, in a united way for what is right. It's because we're not coming and working together to, to proclaim the gospel. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us those opportunities in our community to stand together with those who are united by the blood of Christ. And that, God, that we would be one in our beliefs, that we would be one in our goal to continue to grow closer to Christ and to continue to be used by you to bring as many as possible to salvation. God, we thank you for what you've entrusted to us. We thank you that we are able to be a light in this community. I pray, God, that you would protect this church, that you would guide and lead our, our, our elders, our leaders, our, our pastors, that you would continue to give us opportunities to preach the gospel, to win the lost, and to teach and preach your word. We pray, God, that more churches, more like-minded churches would would. would be planted, would, would come about in our community, in our county, in our country, God, that, that, that have the same goal. And God, I pray that you would continue to give us the freedoms that we've had to do those things. We do pray for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, God, who are at very real risk of physical and torture and, and all kinds of other harm simply because of their faith in Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you would protect them, that you would strengthen them, and that you would continue to grow the church in those places where there is much persecution. Uh, we thank you, God, for the oneness that's created. I thank you for the many times that I've been to different places where everything is different, but that there's a unity because of the faith that we share in Jesus Christ. And so, God, I just pray that you would bring oneness that you would bring unity in the way that only you can, that the world would see it, that they would be drawn to it, and that we would see revival in our country. We praise things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Um, all right, guys, just a couple things. Um, we do have family discussion questions. They are, uh, they are posted. Communitybiblechurch.us slash info. You can pull them up on your phones or electronic devices. You can print them out. I encourage you to... Uh, Talk through them with your families, ideally. I think this is, a, this is an important topic, right? Um, lots, of, lots, of, uh, lots of really good conversation, I think, can happen around this topic. I, I could have really made this lesson into an entire series. Um, don't necessarily have the time for that, nor really the desire for that. But, uh, <laughs> but it's important. There, there's, there's a lot of division. And, and there's some good reasons why we're divided, because people are compromising the truth. But then there's also some really silly reasons why Christians are divided. And so we need to, we need to understand that. Um, but uh, I encourage you guys to, to, to think, think about that. Pray. Pray for the church, right? Our church. Our specific church. The universal church. Pray for the persecuted church. Um, I, I hear on a regular basis about uh, persecution that's happening in, in not just the Middle East, but places like India, places like China places that we've been before on, on mission trips that are, um, there's just a, an evil persecution that's happening to the Christians in some of these places. And so we need to pray for them and, and, and really lift them up to God and, and pray that God would continue, continue to work and strengthen his church even with the persecution that's happening. Um, next week, next week, uh, you guys want to know where we're headed? I told you already, but I'll tell you again. Uh, next week, I know uh, it's a, it's a uh, week. Uh, well, next weekend is a week where a uh, lot of a uh, lot of evil things I think tend to kind of happen, right? Uh, around uh, around Halloween, uh, our family tries to take that and flip it upside down and use it for good, and 
our community is usually overrun with people, and so uh, they're going to come right to our driveway, right to our door. We can invite them to, uh, <laughs> to church. So, uh, so we, we use it as an opportunity to, to invite people to, to come to church. This year, what we have the opportunity to invite them to Friend Day, which is that very Sunday, right? Um, the next day, actually. So so really neat opportunity. Um, but, uh, but all kinds of craziness happens. And so we're going to talk about uh, what exactly is going on in the spiritual world. Um, what's the deal with angels, demons, all that kind of stuff. We don't know a lot, but we know some because God has revealed some through his word. And so we're going to uh, we're gonna look at uh, what God wants us to know about the spiritual world. All right? Sound good? I think it's, uh, I think it'll be good. So come back next week and invite your friend. Or I, I'm not saying you have one friend, so invite your friends, right? I know you guys have many. Um, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll answer those questions next week. All right, guys, thanks again for coming. Appreciate y'all. Have a good night. And uh, if I don't see you before next Thursday, I'll see you next Thursday. Amen and amen. Let it be.